Uh, so I'm Joe Klein from Time Magazine, and this is a topic that when someone mentions it to me in the abstract, or when I think about it in the abstract, I get totally depressed. Um, but then, usually, when I'm on a panel or talking to people who are working in this area, uh, I get very excited by what they're doing and what can be done, and, uh, and, and just the, the velocity of change uh, when it comes to teaching and especially training young people for the jobs of the future. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce the panel and uh, we will go from there. On my immediate left, we have one of my favorite Congress members in all of history. <laughs> I've been doing this for 45 years. There may be none that <laughs> That, uh, that, that <laughs> match Jane Harmon in terms of her ability to, and willingness to think, to innovate, um, and to be courageous. She's now the head of the Wood Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Jane Harmon, next to her is, uh, you're not gonna get as good an introduction because I've known <laughs> yeah, Jane forever, right? right? But I'm sure you're really cool too. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is Gabi Zedelmeyer uh, from Hewlett Packard and she is in charge of, um, of uh, social innovation there. Next to her is Carlos Dominguez, um, who I just heard is Cuban Chinese. Cuban Chinese, Terrific. very confused. <laughs> Very confused. Uh, no, Cuba, we'll, we'll, we look forward to the day when we get the benefit of the great diversity and creativity of the Cu Cuban people. Um, yeah. Back again, because they were among my favorites. I think, by the way, Cuba and Iran. Thank you. I'm, I'm starting to feel like Jane now. <laughs> yeah, Cuba, Cuba and Iran are, are the two countries in the world with the greatest <coughs> mismatch between their government and their people. Carlos, um, Carlos is a senior vice president at Cisco. He, he's a futurist and an expert in innovation. Uh, and next to him is uh, Nodis Midaraki, um, who's got a big job. He's with the government of Greece, and he's the minister for economics and competitiveness. Uh, I'd like to start first with you, Gabi, and, uh, and then you, Carlos. Okay. And, <coughs> Why don't you tell us briefly what you're doing? So I do think there is um, there is both fire and hope out there. Uh, I work um, at Hewlett Packard in sustainability and social innovation, and that means that we go and work with our businesses and the labs, uh, and all of the skills of our I don't know over 300,000 employees on solving some of the critical societal issues, specifically environment, health, and education. And since we're talking today about this massive issue of, um, of unemployment, you know, I'd, I'd like to sort of um, dig a little bit deeper in, into what we're doing in that space. We've created a few years ago a program that's called HP Life Entrepreneurship Training to tackle exactly that issue. And we've built like 300 centers in 47 countries and built up a curriculum in over 20 languages so that kids could go and learn how to use IT to do a business plan, a marketing plan, to set up a website, and how to really run a business. But we realized that's really limiting because you only have these 300 centers. So the first learning from that was that we needed to take that whole curriculum up on the cloud. So now this is available for anybody around the world to download and, and, and apply. And the second learning I think that's really important to take away is that we now use that curriculum with all of our other partnerships that we already have and hopefully future partnerships that we're about to build. So we just um, agreed with uh, NACI in the US, uh, the National Association for Community Colleges, that we bring the curriculum to their community colleges because then you have this offline online combination. Also, we were able to um, sell 1.5 million PCs into Uttar Pradesh in India, and we will preload this program so that the kids will not only um, you know, have technology, but they also have an application, uh, junior achievement, and so forth. So the, the, the real learning here is that, um, that, that we bring existing partnerships and future partnerships together um, to, to create platforms around the world globally to then address this issue via this cloud-based training. Mm -hmm. Okay, Carlos. 
You know, Joe, l let me begin. I, I think most of you probably know what Cisco does, but I'll take uh, five minutes <coughs> to tell you that uh, we um, design, uh, build, and manage uh, large networks, and we're the uh, plumbers behind the Internet. Um, you know, in 1997, after experiencing hypergrowth, we had a very huge challenge where we couldn't find enough workers that could support the kinds of technologies that uh, we needed. And much like any other corporation, you begin by taking a journey to try to solve some of your very specific problems. And what we tried doing was how do we educate and train um, people on learning our technology. So in 1997, we launched a program called the Cisco Networking Academy. Uh, it's grown exponentially. We're uh, 10,000 academies today uh, in 165 countries. We've graduated over 4 million students. Right now there's 1.2 million uh, students in the program. And there's a lot we can share, but you know, what, what I'd like to take away, although ours was to solve a very specific problem, mm -hmm. um, we kind of broke the mold in a lot of areas. And what, what I find the challenges in creating jobs for the 21st century in, a, in the world in which we're living, which is very different than anything we've experienced in the past, you know, you can't approach the problems in the same way we did in the past. And when you try to be very creative and out of the box, uh, you get a lot of resistance because it's very different. So, for example, all our curriculum is delivered uh, computer-based. You know, it's leader-led but computer-based. A lot of the learning institutions when we did that said, oh, it can't be done, right? So we pushed, you know, those models. We introduced uh, a lot of tools that were available today. We've gamified everything. So who said that learning has to be boring, right? Why not make it fun? So we have gaming uh, things. We virtualized a lot of things. Instead of spending money in real hardware, we virtualized the equipment and you can run all these tests. So we broke a lot of ground and we did it also with very unique partnerships. If you see how we've rolled it out, some of it have been partnerships with governments, others have been with inst uh, educational institutions. We've done it with uh, local uh, cities and government. We've done it with community colleges. We've done it with learning centers. So the point is to solve these problems is how do you leverage the lessons learned from companies like HP and Cisco? How do you take it into governments uh, and kind of modify it and really try to address the issue? Have you had any success with that? With oh, we have a lot. I mean, a lot with of- With governments? Yeah, we, we work with them. But again, it, you know, we, when we approach it, Joe, it's, it's really specific in our, ta in our domain. What I'm saying is why not take these models that work and scale it to other industries and to be able to do it in a much broader scale? Okay, I, I'd like to ask you notice, uh, for, um, you've heard these two very enthusiastic people who are doing wonderful things. You have a huge problem in Greece. I think you told me earlier, 60% unemployment in young, among young people. What do you need? And, um, and, and how much is what they're offering mm -hmm. useful to you? Joe, what the corporates are doing is a lot of good work bottom up, but policymakers have to be concerned top down. I heard at the beginning of today's event Dr. George Loothetti speaking very passionately about the need to empower young people in the developing world. But I would argue that the developed world has similar negative structural trends. When I attended a year ago the annual World Bank Ministerial Summit in Tokyo, you heard all the ministers from the developing countries saying their biggest challenge is to create jobs for the young population. But then you heard the ministers from the developed world saying exactly the same thing, that the, if you look together at the developed world, we're suffering from an <coughs> aging population relative to the developing world, we're suffering from a high level of debt and reducing relative Competitiveness. If you look at the latest UN data, most of the FDI now doesn't come to our part of the world. It's actually going to the developing world. So we need, as Europeans, and I would dare to say that there is not yet sufficient leadership at the European level to solve the problem, we need to think top down. What are we doing in Greece, for example? We're working on five policy pillars. We're working on restabilizing the economy. And I'm pleased to say that this year we're going to meet a budget objective and the recession is better than we thought. We're working on structural reforms, and I think fiscal and structural is where most of the European and developed world countries need to work. We need to rebuild our competitiveness. We're working on changing the investment climate, is what the Concordia Index said before, as the readiness of the economy. We're trying to enhance liquidity, which is still a problem in some parts of the world, and we're trying to find catalysts of growth through privatizations. But this is a top-down. Bottom-up, we're also working together with the industry. A lot of uh, big multinationals are now increasing their production in Greece. They're increasing their R&D capacity in Greece. We're trying to empower young people through entrepreneurship to develop new projects. 
I'm very pleased to say that Greece, who had 700 million of inflows this year from big multinational investing in startups in Greece, something that was far from our culture till a couple of years ago. We're working on a dual apprenticeship program, learning from the German example on how do you empower people not only in education, but also in the workforce with practical example. But I think the key point for me, and that's what I want to leave today, is that finding jobs for the entire young population in the developed world will be a big challenge, <clears throat> and the generation that follows ours is the first generation probably after the, the Second World War, which doesn't have the confidence that they will live better than the previous generation. Mm -hmm.